Those are three most important words in Christian life, and I'm sure we are familiar with them. Right? Now, First Corinthians chapter 13, that we call the love chapter, because Paul explains God's love in detail in the chapter. And the, the love, word love appears about nine different times. Now, the chapter 11 of the book of Hebrew that we're going to talk about today, that we can call the faith chapter. Or the hall of faith. So you can see and find the word faith about 28 different times in the chapter. Now faith is important. And everyone has to have some kind of faith. Actually, we cannot go on with your life without having faith. See, if you don't have faith to be alive next day, then you cannot go to bed. <laughs> Everybody has a faith that you will be alive next day for you to go to bed comfortably. If you don't have faith that airplane will work as intended or the pilot is not drunk, then you will not be able to jump on the airplane. It's too dangerous. And if you don't have faith that everything will be okay, then you will kill yourself by worrying about everything. So, everyone has to have some kind of faith. But the author of the Hebrew, when he, he wrote this book of uh, Hebrew, chapter 11, was not talking about that kind of faith. You know, it is not having the faith in luck. It is not having faith in someone else, or not even yourself. Do you have faith in you? We say that. Believe in yourself. Say with me, believe in yourself. Now, we say to each other, to encourage each other, believe in yourself. And I said, please don't. Because we are not strong enough. We are not perfect enough to believe in ourselves. We need to believe in God, who is perfect and who is almighty. So, we're going to talk about that having faith in God. The author mentions you know, so many important characters. Actually, almost every important character in the book of Genesis in this chapter. So, we're going to run together. Are you ready to write? Chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, verses 1 through 22. I'm going to read this. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancient were commanded for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commanded as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death he could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commanded as the one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about the things not yet seen, in the holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is the keeping with the faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to the place he would later receive as, it, as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in the tent, and as did Isaac and Jacob who are heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward the, to the city with the foundation, those uh, um, architect and the builders is God. And by faith, even Sarah, 
who was a past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from his, this one man, and he as good as that, came descendants as numerous as the sky, stars in the sky and as a countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say that such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they have left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was, was about to sacrifice though this, his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offering will be reckoned. Abraham reckoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a in manner of speaking, that he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. And by faith, Joseph, when his his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the barrier of his bones. Amen to that. This is almost like history of Israel that his author wrote. According to these verses, the faith in God requires some essentials. I know it kind of repeats the by faith and by faith and by faith so many times, but it's telling us so many important essentials we need to know. For us to have a faith in God, that we must have following. A three one. What is that? Relationship. Assurance. And action. If we have faith in God, we have to have relationship. We have to have assurance. And we have to have an action. This is what the author is talking about today. First is the faith in God required a relationship. You know? What do you mean having a relationship? We cannot have faith in somebody do not, you do not have a relationship with. Now let's look at the verse 6. I'm going to jump a little bit. Okay? I'm going to talk about every verse, but you're going to go you know, different ways now. The verse 6 tells us why we have to have a relationship with God. What is required for us to have a relationship with God. Now it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists. That He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So by reading these verses, we have to understand when we said we have faith in God, that we are telling the whole world that I have relationship with God. I cannot have faith in God unless I have a relationship. And what kind of relationship is this verse is talking about? First is to believe God exists. And second, seek God. And third, please God. See, if you have a relationship with God, you have to believe God exists. If you have a relationship with God, then you have to be able to seek Him. And then thirdly, to please Him. Now, to believe God exists, how can we have any relationship with somebody who do not exist? I mentioned that. So for us to have a relationship with God, then we have to believe God exists. Is anybody doubt about that right now? I'm sure everybody who came here today, what do you mean? I do believe God exists. Of course, we're Christians. But even those people who come to church every Sunday who are still having struggle to believe that God exists. Now, when you go to court and you're taking an oath and you say this, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me. God. Now, how many people go to court that do not believe that God exists? And I was wondering, before we ask people to raise their hand, say, so help me God, ask them first, do you believe God exists? If they don't believe, which is uh, so many people in this country these days, then it doesn't mean anything. No wonder they lie. 
No wonder they're not afraid. Even after they swear, they're not afraid because they don't believe God exists. Every crisis you have, they say, in God we trust. Have you looked at that? Every time you spend money, I know not many people using cash these days, but when you have that, read that. In God we trust. Can you imagine how many people will start believing God exists every time you spend money looking at that? In God we trust. We sing this song, God bless America, many times. But so many people don't believe God or don't even think about God until they are in trouble, danger, or like in serious desperation. Now, we all know uh, Buffalo Bill, safety, Dahmer Hamlin. And he was not that popular, I guess, but now he is. <laughs> Because he had to go through cardiac arrest on the field that nobody has seen before. I don't know how many people saw that the news that Dan um, Orlovsky, or, or <laughs> that he is the uh, ESPN analyst. And then one day in the TV show, the NFL Live, he says, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for him. I believe God. I'm going to pray for him. And I love to see that happen. Right? Now, my question is, why can't we do that every time? Why do we have to wait until somebody's dying for us to cry out to God? Why can't we start NFL Live? Let us pray together. I love to have a country like that. The people are full of faith in God. They believe that God exists. Now, for us to have a relationship with God, you have to believe God exists. That's first. And that's how we can have faith in God. See, we're going to... Have faith in God, you have to have a relationship with God. To have that faith in God, then for us to have a relationship with God, you have to believe God exists first. And second is seek God. Right? Believing God exists is a good start, but it's not enough. You have to seek God. Why do we have to seek God? Because we cannot see God with our eyes. We cannot touch God with our, our hands. We cannot hear God with our ears. We cannot experience God daily. Easily, without seeking God. Believe God exists is not enough. Satan believes that. You have to be able to seek God. You have to have a heart to search for God every day. Because God's not going to um, speak loudly to us many times. He whispers. That is why we're studying the Word of God. It's like the way to we seek God. This is why we pray. That Pastor Jonathan said, always, we pray. Why we pray? This is how we seek God. Yeah, how I seek God's work, His power, His will. Nobody can understand God's will without praying, without knowing His words, and being sensitive on things happening in your world. In your life, open your eyes every day and smell the coffee. <laughs> Think about it, what God is going to do through you and with you, to you, today. Every day is important and essential. It matters. And everybody you're dealing with is a create, uh, 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 critical because God allowed them. Live your life with God. So it's not just believe God exists. By seeking God daily, and then please God. See, we believe God. We seek God. Why? To please God. I know some people believe God to please themselves. God, help me so I can be pleased. Work with me so I can be pleased. No, we are searching God and seeking God so we can Please, God. Now, if you have a relationship with someone, and if that relationship is a good one, then you want to please that person that you have the relationship with. If we have a relationship with God, then our ultimate purpose and goal is pleasing God. When does God be pleased? When we tell God, I trust in you. I believe in you. I have faith in you. God loves to hear that. Now, all the parents, any parents, do you know how, you, if you're parents, you know how your children can break your heart. 
If you're children, do you know how you can break your parents' heart? Tell your parents saying, I don't need you anymore. I can guarantee they will break your parents' heart. I don't need you anymore. That's the worst thing you can do as children to parents. I mean, you can disobey your parents. You can even argue your parents. But don't ever tell your parents, I don't need you anymore. See, God doesn't want to hear that either. The worst thing is his people. Is tell God, I don't need you anymore. We are here to please God. And verse 2 says, this is what the ancient were commanded for. Why were they commanded? Why was God pleased by them? Because they have faith in God. Not only that, the verse we just read, and those people were seeking God honestly, God will reward them. What a deal. You know, isn't it nice? I mean, when we became Christian, and when we says we have faith in God, that means that we are telling the world that we have a relationship with God. And for us to have a relationship with God, we have to believe God exists. We have to be able to tell the whole world that we believe that, that He is existence. And we need to depend on Him. We need to please Him. And then when we do that, that God will reward us. That's what the author is telling us today. For us to have faith in God, we have to have relationship with Him. And the second, it's a force of faith in God that we have to have assurance. Says, go okay, Start with the first one. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. It says the confidence. It says assurance on what? It says on what we hope for and about what we do not see. See, it is telling us that we have to have, have assurance that what we have not seen, what we have not experienced, that is what the, the ancient people did. The Israelites, they did. They trust God enough, have assurance on what they have not seen, what they have not experienced. That means they have the assurance of their past and their future. They have assurance of what God has done, what God will do, and what God promised. That kind of assurance we have to have. When we say, oh, I have faith in God, I'm telling the whole world, that I have an assurance of what God did. I have assurance of what God will do and what God promised. See, throughout the whole chapter, the author of Hebrew they give us many examples that people have the assurance of that. I mean, you can call all the names. It starts with the Asians, then the overall, and then Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, Joseph. And they all live their life with faith in God. Now, let's talk about assurance of what God did. The verse 3 tells us that by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is a sin was not made out of what was visible. See, we believe the whole earth and heaven were created by God. God spoke. It happened. We believe by faith. This is what author says. It is a different than believing the theory. It is a different than discussing of what might happen. It is different than searching. Oh yeah, let's study. Let's test that what might happen in the beginning of this universe. But we don't have issues because we believe nothing is impossible for God. So when God said, I created by speaking, we says, hallelujah. We believe. People believe. That's what it means to have a faith in God. That we have assurance of what, what God did. Now, 
this just first tells us one thing, just creation of all. But what, ha- what else has God done in your life, each and every moment? Do you believe what God did throughout all your life? Are you looking back, sometimes looking back your life? No, I do every day. When I open my, my eyes, I look back yesterday. I look back last week. Now, I don't remember a lot of things these days. But I look back five years ago. I look back ten years ago. Now, throughout the whole year last year, 2022, when we talk about, oh, can we do become united in one church? I constantly look back from the beginning. And constantly look back from the, my life. Not just 10, 15 years ago, but how I was born, how I was raised. I came here because God brought me here. And how I decided to serve God. Went to seminary and started church. I mean, I'm looking at all that. Because without that, we wouldn't be here today. Without all the things happened in my life for 60 years, today would not be like this. It is not an accident. It is a plan. God had a plan. So I look back and try to learn what God had done with me through me and to me. And I hope we do that together as a church. Looking back at why God put us together and what God is expecting us to do. What is our future? See, the a shaving assurance on what God did is not just creation part. But everything else God had done with every one of us. You all have different backgrounds, different history, different life. Can you imagine? We all get put together. Like, you know, we can write an encyclopedia looking like book kind of thing. Like first chapter, you know, Pastor Jonathan's history, how he lived his life and finally arrived here and how we decided to meet in my chapter, your chapter, you know, all that. God has that. Second is assurance in what God will do. See, having assurance of what God did will help us have assurance of what God will do. If God helped me, guide me all this time, if God has a vision and plan for my life and all of us together, put us together, then we have faith in God that He will do, continue to what He had done already. That's why we can get excited. That's why we can get say yes. When we said, I have a faith in God, it's not just like, oh, I just believe. Well, you got to understand what that is. What God will do. Now, here comes Noah, verse 7. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, his future, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. See, I'm sure that Noah is like us. You know, I'm trying to save my family because that's what God told them. Save your family, but eventually... Through them, that generations of people were born. By his faith, he condemned the world that became heir of the righteousness, and that is the keeping with the faith. See, Noah, when God came to him to ask him to build an ark, he never seen it rain before, or at least the way it rained. I know people are disgusting. Like, you know, did Noah ever see rain before? Yes and no, but it doesn't matter. The well, fact is, Noah never seen the rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And because he had faith in God, to believe God, for what he's going to do in the future, that he could spend about 120 years or so to build an ark. When is the longest time you are worked on some project? Two hours? 30 minutes? <laughs> One year? Noah did for 120 years. That's a pretty long time. That required true faith, assurance in what God will do. God, when God told them, told Noah, I said it will be rain that many days and everybody will be wiped out, he had to believe that to be able to do what he did. See, having assurance in what God did. And assurance what God will do. And of course, they'll help us to have assurance with what God promised. See, most of this 
uh, chapter is full of people that who believed God in His promises. Of course, Abraham is the first. You know, we all know that God's promise, Abraham, right? And when Abraham was Abraham, that God came to him and told him, just do. Go to the land that I will show you. Leave everything behind. Something none of us can easily do. Can we do that? Leave everything behind and go to the place, the land that God said he would show? That is a promise. And Abraham did. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he called to go to place that he would later receive, as in his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going, right? And then by verse 9, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in the tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who heirs with him with the same promise. Do you know this? That Abraham believed God, his promise that God says that you go to the land I will show you. He did not say, okay, when you live your life, you're going to enjoy, you're going to experience and all that. He didn't. So Abraham had to believe some that what is God's promise about. Because when Abraham went to the place, the land that God promised, he never experienced a luxury per se. He never owned land in death. That is why he lived in the tent like foreigners. Eventually, that land belongs to him, but he never experienced that. The verse 10 says, For he was looking forward to the city with the foundation, those uh, whose architect and builder is God. So when God promised, I'm going to show you the land, when Abraham was believed God's promise, it's much bigger. There's something I don't know yet, but something that God has prepared for me. And that is not just the land in this world. It goes beyond that. And verse 11, And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who has made the promise. Now, we know the story, if you know the Genesis, that Sarah laughed. She laughed at angel, laughed at God when she heard, you're going to have a baby. He said, you're kidding me. At my age, look at my husband. He's so old. But eventually, she had to believe what she heard. For her to be pregnant. If she didn't believe what she heard, she would have come close to Abraham. When the old man comes to her, honey, he says, go away. For her to be pregnant and be able to sleep with Abraham, she had to believe what she heard was true. It would happen. And then verse 12 says, and so from this woman, and he said, he, as good as that, Abraham, came descendants as numerous as the skies in the, uh, stars in the sky and as countless as the sand in the seashore. What God promised happened later, after Abraham died, after his descendants even died. That is faith. That is assurance. When we say assurance, then we think, oh yeah, I better see with my eyes before I die. I better be able to experience before I die. But that's not happened to all those people. None of them. See, verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. What does that mean? That means they have not experienced what God promised yet and died. Living by faith. They did not receive the things they promised. They only saw them and they welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were or foreigners and strangers on earth. Isn't who we are? That I'm a stranger, I'm a foreigner on this earth? Because we are looking not only on things on the earth, but go beyond that. The people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. What is that? It's a place they're going to go. See, if they have been thinking, verse 15, of the country they have left, which is their home country, then they would have had the opportunity to return. I'm going to go back to my home country, but that's not country they're looking for and waiting for. Verse 16, instead of, they were longing for a better country. Do you love the United States? 
Okay, people are watching. Do you love United States? <laughs> yes, you live here, right? You better. I do. But I have a better country. This is what those people in Genesis had. Better country. They were look longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. He has, for he has prepared a city for them. See, God is preparing a city for you and me. God is preparing the place for you and me. That is what Jesus promised. This is what those people believed. So they were not crying out to see with their own eyes. They were not like, oh yeah, when God promised, I better have that while I'm alive. No, it didn't happen. So don't expect. But there will be a better one, bigger one, much more amazing than what can you imagine. And then there's another test. Testing his faith. Now, by faith, for 17, Abraham, who had, uh, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises that was about to sacrifice his one and only son. So finally, Abraham got the son. Finally, oh yeah, in my age, old age, you allow me, allow me, us, to have a child. Okay, I believe in you. Now, God is saying, give that child to me as an offering. Verse 18, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So what is that, God? You told me when we're trying to have another child. He says, no, that's not it. Isaac is the one. And through Isaac, you'll have more offsprings. Through Isaac, you have descendants. Now you're asking me to offer his life to you. Abraham reasoned, verse 19 says, that God could even raise the dead. How amazing, right? That's a faith. I don't understand why God asked me to give up my son's life through him, that he promised that we will have a nation. Now, I don't understand. This is how normally we we'll react. But Abraham says, okay, somehow God will keep his promise. That when you go to your life and you think you pray and you think you pray and you think God gave you some promise. That God promised to, for me to have this kind of career, relationship, life, whatever. And then you have to some tough life situation. And then you're looking at God. God, are you keeping your promise? Or we can say, even though my situation is so dark, so hard, so hopeless, but I know and I believe, I have faith in God, somehow God will keep his promise. This is what Abraham believed. If I kill my son, he'll raise his life. Can you imagine that? If I die, he'll raise me. That is faith. I will why would we be afraid of dying then? When I die, he will raise me. Abraham believed that. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in any manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Not only Abraham, but even Joseph. Faith. By faith, verse 22, Joseph, when his end was near, he was dying, spoke about Exodus to the Israelites from Egypt. So he was in Egypt. When he was dying, he told his children, said, when I die, take my body to go to the land that God promised. They gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones because I believe God will keep his promise to bring all those people to the land that he promised, even though we are living in the Egypt. We eventually going to go, to go there. I want to go there first. So please take my body, dead body, to bury there. That's faith. That's assurance. Let us not just have faith, but faith have assurance. I know sometimes the faith, not sometimes the definition of faith should include assurance, but we have to even do a better job. Faith, required relationship, and assurance. 
And then also, it requires action. Now, I said faith requires action. You can't even change that to faith, true faith, results in action. It can go both ways. The James says, the faith without action is dead. So faith has to go with the action. Whether faith requires action or faith results in action, either way, faith cannot stand alone. Because all of these people who are mentioned in the book of Hebrew right now, they live their life by faith. And because of that, they did things with their faith. So what does that mean? If you have true faith, what is required or what are the results of the true faith? True worship, true fellowship, and true submission. That's the faith. If you people in faith that you'll have true worship, you'll have true fellowship, and you'll have true submission. The verse 4, by faith is Abel, brought a God a better offering. You know, Cain and Ab- uh, Abel brought offering to God, but God took Abel's, not the Cain's. And then Cain was upset and eventually killed Abel. But by faith, he was commended as a righteous. God called him that when God spoke well of his off- offerings. And by faith, Abel still speak, even though he's dead, because his truth is still speaking to the whole nation, all people. What is that? That Abel gave God true offering. Giving offering to God is worshiping God. True worship. People worship God. People gather to worship God. But not all the worship are true worship. Just like not all the offerings were the offerings that God were pleased. True worship is worship that God pleased. True worship is bringing our sacrifice to God. We don't come to worship to receive. We come to worship to offer. When you come to the door, hi, ah, welcome, thank you for coming. What did you bring today? <laughs> What are you going to offer to God today? And the people are going to walk away from church maybe. What do they want from me? I came to receive. I came to receive love. I came to receive fellowship. I came to receive education. I came to receive food. I came to receive. What do you mean? Offering. People don't like the time of offering either. But it's not time of offering. It's very important. It is a whole service, whole worship. It's an offering to God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So we can ask each other, So what did you bring today? Oh, I brought my whole body. Whatever that may be. We are here. To offer to God. When we praise, we are offering this praise, praise to God. So worship cannot just on Sunday morning. Worship is throughout the whole week. Every day. We are living our life to offer to God. And that is the, 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 the worship that God is pleased. So, by looking at what Abel did, I hope we learn to live our life by worshiping God daily. And I hope we can ask each other every time we get it, hey, what are you going to offer? True fellowship is Enoch. See, every one of these people have those things. By faith, verse 5 says, Enoch was taken from this side so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as the one who pleased God. Now, this is true fellowship, isn't it? The Genesis said that Enoch walked faithfully with God. Walked with God faithfully. He did not come and go. Come and go. It was not once in a while. Faithfully, constantly, all the time, walking with God. 
That is a true fellowship. And if you have faith in God, you're telling the world that I am walking with God. I'm not going to do anything without God's guidance. God's approval. Without singing, God will be pleased by this. Last word is true submission, right? Last two chapter, uh, verses. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. What does this mean that when you bless people, that means you're submitting their lives to God. See, we need to submit ourselves to God. But it's not just us. Isaac and Jacob submit their children's life to God. I pray for my children throughout all their lives, even before they were born. Because you, as some of you know, my wife miscarried you know, twice. So we have to pray for unborn child, to give us child. And then, of course, when child was born, you have to pray for this child. But why my prayer is that, Lord, this child belongs to you. This child belongs to you. It, it gave me freedom. <laughs> because it's your child, not mine. <laughs> you take care of this child. Problem? That's your problem. <laughs> not mine. I'm not joking. I live that way. I dare my children that way. Ever since they were young, I told them, this is your life. You can ask them, this is your life. Dad, what do you want me to do? No, this is your life. Your life, given by God. I was just used by God. I'm submitting my life to God. I'm submitting your life to God. When you have faith in God, you're telling the world, Everything I do, I'm submitting to God. Everybody I meet, I'm going to try to submit themselves to God too. Do you have faith in God? I hope you do. And I hope when you say, I have faith in God, you have all these things. Have understanding. And be able to tell people about it. Let's have faith in God. Believing yourself is not enough. Believe in God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning, this worship, the words you've given us, Lord. There's so much. I was preparing and praying, and I was experiencing, like, finding the treasure. There's so much more than what we discussed today. And I pray, Lord, that every one of us will go through and then look through your world and find this treasure and be able to share with one another. They don't even have to wait until they hear the message. They can give message to each other. I hope and pray that our church is going to be like that. The people who belong to the church will be like that. That you will be honored each and every single day. Lord, help us to become the people who have a true faith in you. And help us to have, help us to become the people who understand what that means. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.